got him. Oh, you got him. Oh, you got him. Oh, you got him. If everyone could please find a seat, we'll get the program started in just a moment. So I'll introduce you probably best. Uh, you know, you can either stand aside or you can even sit right next to Mr. Moran. Uh, if everyone could please find a seat, we'll get the program started in just a moment. If everyone could please find a seat, we'll get. I'll give you a real quick tour if they have a chance. Yeah, it's a fantastic place. If everyone would please find a seat. Thank you. He mentioned you in a talk. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah, Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to tonight's public affairs program. I'm John Miko, the executive director of the Union League Legacy Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to this very special program. The Legacy Foundation is the nonprofit charity of the Union League of Philadelphia. We are inspired by the United States Constitution and the history and the values of this great, this great institution, the Union League of Philadelphia. All of our programs use that first line in our bylaws as the, as the real essence of what we do. Uh, every member shall support the Constitution and the free enterprise system. Thank you. So we are, we are thrilled to have a, a wonderful program tonight that is, I think, in many ways, spot on with those values and our values. And of course, that's consistent with all the programs that we do uh, throughout the year. Uh, all of this is made possible through generous contributions from members and others like you who share our values and want others to understand and appreciate them. I thank you all for your generous contributions. Um, a few housekeeping items. Uh, number one, please turn off your cell phone. I'll give you a moment to do that. Our speaker will, uh, his presentation will go about 40, 45 minutes. We will have Q&A, which will be moderated effectively by me, I hope effectively. Um, and it's important that you use the microphones because we are on Zoom and YouTube and our online audience cannot hear your questions unless you use uh, the microphone. Um, we have two wonderful programs to end our fall season. Uh, one is this coming Monday. It's a, a preview of the Supreme Court year, and I think it's actually going to be much bigger than that. Uh, it's with uh, Jeff Rosen from the National Constitution Center and Robbie George from Princeton University. 
and it's going to be moderated by Judge Pratter from federal court here in Philadelphia. Uh, sign up now if you want to go, because I think we have over 300 people signed up right now. We're in Lincoln Hall. It will be a crowd. So make sure if you're not signed up that you sign up as soon as possible. And then on uh, December 1st, uh, Bill Kashutis uh, for a Civil War Roundtable is going to talk about William Still and the Underground Railroad. So uh, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the chair of the Education Committee of the Union League Legacy Foundation, Mr. Steve Target, who will introduce our speaker. Steve. Good evening, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce this evening our speaker, Kenny Shu. Mr. Shu is a journalist, activist, and author. In July 2021, he published his first book, An Inconvenient Minority, The Attack on Asian Americans, Excellence, and the Fight for mediocracy, meritocracy, excuse me. <laughs> meritocracy, thank you very much. This book is largely about the lawsuit against Harvard University's race-based admission policy that discriminates against Asian American students in favor of other less qualified minority applicants. Kenny has spoken on the consequences of the Harvard case and its identity politics ideology in front of groups as diverse as the nationally renowned Pacific Legal Foundation to the Boston Rally for Education Rights to the Connecticut Parents Union. He's appeared on Fox News' Tucker Carlson Tonight Show. He's written an op-ed for the New York Post, and he's given numerous interviews on the subject of discrimination against Asian Americans. He is a commentary writer for The Federalist, The Washington Examiner, The Daily Signal, and The Quillette. His journalism is beloved by the American, the Asian American community and other Activists, Asian American activists have frequently solicited his advice on how to organize for meritocracy and the equal rights. As such, he maintains extensive connections with the nationwide meritocracy movement. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kenny Shu. Good evening. I, um, I'm so grateful for the Union League tonight. And I have many thanks to give out, but one thanks I want to give out is to Harvard University. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I did not go to Harvard. However, I do have Harvard to thank for one thing, my career. <laughs> I became an author, and one of the reasons why I got into these issues is because I studied the predicament of Asian Americans at Harvard, and that allowed me to see things in a very different light and allowed me to reject the false narratives that are permeating through our society about race. And I will get into that with you tonight. My title, the title of this speech today is called Wokeness and Disruption. I wanna ask this question, what is wokeness? <clears throat> wokeness is a temperament that seeks to assert the idea that America is a racist country above all other views. It's an ideology that seeks to position itself above other ideologies. You cannot be woke and simultaneously say be colorblind. You have to be woke and prioritize wokeness as the first thing above other things. And I'll get into this a little more. Sometimes, it leads to productive conversations about the experience of minorities in this country, but most of the time, wokeness leads to this. Are roads racist? Are trees racist? But I wanna give you an example of, of wokeness in action, and particularly, how wokeness is an ideology that can be disrupted and why it needs to be disrupted. This is my friend, Phil Lubin. 
My friend Phil is a universally renowned astrophysicist at the University of California, Santa Barbara. His parents are Jewish emigres from Lithuania and the Ukraine. On his father's side are survivors of the Holocaust. On his mother's side are survivors of the Holodomor. Phil grew up on the streets of Los Angeles, a near-do-well in high school, without a faint ounce of intention to go to college until one of his friends persuaded him to at least apply. Phil did not understand how intelligent he really was until he got into every school he applied to. He pursued his one dream in life, which is to become an astrophysicist. Today, my friend Phil is one of the premier experts on black holes in, dare I say, the galaxy. He is regularly called upon to share his findings with NASA and the leading science associations in the world. Little did he know, however, that in recent years, he would be called upon for yet a greater and nobler cause, deconstructing his whiteness. See, my friend Phil recently joined a diversity, equity, and inclusion group at his home university in Santa Barbara. In this diversity, equity, and inclusion group, a woman stands up. She's trying to push forward a proposal, an equity, she calls it an equity proposal, that would artificially raise the number of Blacks at her faculty. Raise your hand if you're white, she says. Phil does not raise his hand. The woman glowers at him. Raise your hand if you're white, she says, expressing frustration as Phil's hand remains on the table. I'm not white, Phil says quietly. Listen, I don't know what kind of game you're playing, she says. I am not white, Phil repeats and stands up. Is this white? He gestures at his arm. Then he puts his arm on top of the whiteboard in the classroom. Is my arm the same color as the board? He says, look, we know you're just trying to stir the pot. The woman says, I am not, Phil says. I am merely pointing out the statement that you made that I am white is in fact incorrect. In fact, I'm a shade of beige. And by the way, so are you. <laughs> I am black, the woman says. And then so am I, Phil says. The reason why you perceive me as white is because sunlight refracts off of my skin at a certain wavelength. You zoom in close enough on a microscope, you can see that I am just as black as all of you. You are wrong, the woman shouts. You are white and you are denying it, just like every arrogant white person would. And she loses control. She senses control over her narrative is slipping. Her narrative requires total obedience. Her narrative requires that the voices that break past the narrow boxes of race are silenced. A lone dissenter must be stripped, tarred and feathered, removed from the discourse. You see, Phil Lubin is a man who refused to be white when told to be. He stood his ground and broke the comptrollers. He asserted his individuality in a discourse that is robbed of it. He was tarred and berated for it, but he won. He prevented the, the race ideologues from proceeding with their five-year plans by foiling them at step one. And step one is always get people to admit that they're white. See, the problem, the problem that Phil poses to race ideologues is that the more that he says that he, a peach pigmented person is not white, the less power these race ideologues have over him. And he knows this, and more importantly, they know this, because race ideologues gain their power by claiming that individuals must do certain things 
by virtue of their race. For this to work, they need to get the vast majority, if not all, of white people to admit that they are white. Whitey, do this, they say. Blacky, do this. And in reality, the kind of performance they demand from both groups is insufferable and degrading, no matter what race you are. Let's give the example of whiteness. Here is what woke people typically instruct whites to do to engage in various acts of compliant self-flagellation, including, but not limited to, apologizing on behalf of other whites for their racism. As you can see, the Chick-fil-A CEO recently urged white people to apologize, uh, to take action against racism. He says he does not blame looters after multiple locations were damaged, damaged last week. Um, down this article, you see that there was uh, Dan Cathy, this Chick-fil-A CEO, instructed his employees to uh, apologize for, for racism, for other white people's racism. So not even for your own racism, for the entire white race's racism. So that's one thing they instruct whites to do. Here's another thing. Um, another thing is I spoke, this is an article I, I wrote in Legal Insurrection um, where I interviewed a, a, a white school teacher at a diversity training. And in this diversity training, they asked white people to sit in a circle and stay silent as people of color hurled insults at them. So that is another thing to, to basically to shut up and listen. Here's another thing, to read white fragility and how to be anti-racist. Um, our, favorite, our favorite book, White Fragility, um, was, which has made the authors millionaires. Um, this is another thing they would instruct white people to do. And then most importantly, to tell all of your white friends to do the same thing. So these are some of the things they would instruct white people to do. But the woke, to, in order to take command and control, of course, of them and their persona, but the woke also instruct even the people of oppressed races to behave in morally degrading ways, or they fetishize morally degrading behavior in the name of so-called minority or POC power. I'll give you an example. So first, here's an example. A common refrain of wokeness is to, for example, blame racist policing for the disproportionate rate at which black males get shot. And I will confess to you personally, I gave this narrative a fair shot. I really did. I, during the height of the, the, the movement in 2020, I investigated and I looked at all of the data that I could. Perhaps there is some kind of bias as to who to shoot and not to shoot after all. So I kept hearing, for example, that there is a disproportionate percentage of police shooting victims who are black. So I did a little independent research and I found out, of course, that in 2018, 37% of those killed by police were black, but 50% of violent police altercations were with black Americans. So if anything, the implicit bias favors black Americans in these occurrences rather than persecutes them. In any case, the narrative about racist killings and police shootings is a narrative that needs more challenge to it, at the very least. But what this narrative does, and, and you see it all the time, is it, how it actually leaks into these communities, these low-income, poor communities, and they discourage them for example, from say calling the police when they need help. This is why, this is what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, where after the riots that happened there, you saw an increase in crime because of the lack of police presence there, which by the way, 
impacted black families, property, and safety all around. It resulted in a decline of black family property values and a negative impact on that community's financial fortunes. If we really care about safety and public safety, we should do what 81% of all black voters in New York City said they wanted, which was more policing, more safety. Or just think about what this assertion of racist policing without evidence does to the kids who actually hear this. See, there was this landmark study by the sociologist Eric Kaufman that showed that 81% of black Biden voters and 70%, by the way, of similarly progressive whites, so not just black voters, but also white voters who lean progressive, 81% of black Biden voters and 70% of similarly progressive white voters believed that more black Americans are killed by police violence than being hit by a car. The reality is that black Americans are more than 10 times more likely to be hit by a car than to be shot by the police. This is, these are inconvenient facts to the narrative, but they need to be said because telling people lies doesn't help them. In this same article here, you saw that the percentage of people who believed that they could make their own plans work out and who had self-confidence in themselves, which is it's a proxy measure for self-confidence, declined from 81% of Black Americans to 63% of Black Americans when they were exposed to the ta Coates passage that said, in America, it is natural to, de to destroy the Black body. So when, you're, when you read these kinds of passages, and I speak from a sense of minority marginalization, because I know the temptation. I know the temptation for many minorities of all colors to buy into this narrative of systemic racism, because you look at other people around you, and maybe sometimes you look at successful people around you, and you say, they don't look like me. So there has to be something breaking me away. But the reality is this kind of woke narrative, this kind of narrative that seeks to assert that America is a racist country is only hurting people. It's only hurting people. So why do people do it? Why do people assert this kind of narrative? Yet the woke have to offer something something tantalizing, seriously tantalizing to get people to accept this horrible, destructive philosophy. So what they offer is a multi-level marketing scheme, which is to say an assertion of virtue to bully other people into submission. Other people who are less morally superior than yourself. Because, for example, racism is America's original sin, they get to claim that anti-racism is America's original virtue. And so in an effort to deconstruct white supremacy, they create a new moral hierarchy that places the woke at the top and that leeches into everybody you tell. You say, I have the truth. Everybody listen to me, and you get to assert yourself at the top of this moral hierarchy, which becomes, by the way, a moral economy. Because as you can see, wokeness is expensive. A typical California diversity training can cost up to $1,500 an hour. A typical Ibram X. Kendi, the author of How to Be Anti-Racist lecture, can cost $50,000 and up. Google's chief diversity officer, Melanie Parker, clears $250,000 a year, and UC Berkeley's head of diversity and inclusion makes $450,000 a year. Not to mention the costs of wokeness bar none. Not to mention the drag admitting students who are less qualified 
in the name of equity bear on the teaching, the research, and the merited prestige of a university or corporation. When classrooms have classes in which a substantial portion of the students are less qualified than the other, the teacher has to accommodate them. They sacrifice rigorous, high quality instruction for the teaching to the lowest common denominator. For the sake of equity, one sacrifices excellence. So these costs of wokeness, these costs of implementing equity proposals actually make it harder for small businesses and small entrepreneurs, the very people we should be targeting to help, they actually make it harder for them to compete. Let me give you an example. Google, for example, was recently made a, a huge investment into wokeness. They said, we want 15% of our software engineers to be black and Hispanic and underrepresented minorities. Why? Because it positions them as ethically motivated and driven. It allows them to avoid these nasty PR situations and government lawsuits. And most importantly, it allows Google to bully other companies into taking these costly bureaucratic steps that limit their competitiveness and allow the giants to retain their gianthood. So has Goldman Sachs. They recently announced they would not contract with legal services company without legal services companies that don't have at least 15% so-called diverse directors. By diverse, they mean black and Hispanic. They don't mean Asian. Um, and I'll get to that. And I will, don't worry. NASDAQ says they will not list companies that don't maintain a board of directors of at least 15% Black and Latino. But what Google and Facebook will not admit is that the reason why we have an equity uh, and an inequality in the number of software engineers is not because of racism. Google and Facebook's software engineers are nearly 90% Asian American. And the reason why they can't find qualified Black and Hispanic talent is because only 2% of the math PhDs in this country are Black, unfortunately. There are fewer than 2,000 Black children who graduate every year with an SAT higher and SAT in math higher than 700. This is compared to 50,000 Asians and 45,000 whites. There is a skills gap in this country and fixing it means telling the truth about it. And you're not gonna get anywhere by claiming that this is because of racism. You're not gonna get anywhere. So, but here's the other, here's the piece de resistance for why wokeness works for elite corporations while destroying small businesses. Because the elite corporations, the Harvards, the Berkeleys, the Googles, the Facebooks of the world, they can scoop up the black talent that currently does exist that is appropriately qualified and then aggressively promote them up the food chain to reach this executive level equity. While the smaller corporations will be punished because they don't have the same diversity quotas or they, they simply cannot find software engineers who happen to be black and Hispanic because they've already been hired into the big firms and they could be paid more. So, as such, here's the picture. The picture of wokeness is that the Googles and Facebooks of the world who claim that there is a massive racism problem benefit from wokeness by punishing the little guy who can't afford to pay its costs, who can't find the talent that Google and Facebook can afford to pay. So what wokeness is, and this is what you guys should understand about what wokeness is. What wokeness is consequentially is a rearrangement of the structures of the world 
into a small economic elite who is trying to reinforce their position through cultural hegemony. But there is a glitch in their system. What if the employees in these elite corporations and universities and organizations realize what's truly going on and they fight back? Allow me to introduce the inconvenient minority. You see, Asian Americans have been historically discriminated in the United States. They have arrived here with largely no generational wealth, social connections, or even familiarity with American culture. In fact, as I argue in my book, An Inconvenient Minority, 80% of Vietnamese immigrants come to this country knowing little to no English. Yet, Asian Americans succeed in this country. They outperform even whites in measures like educational attainment and household income. And the reason, my friends, is very simple. It's because of culture. There's no other way to explain it. For example, Asian culture places a unique emphasis on work ethic, and it shows Asian Americans study twice as many hours as the average American. Asian Americans place a unique educational burden upon their children. Asian Americans have higher two-parent family structures. They have lower rates of crime. They have lower rates of drug use than the average American. In fact, my book's analysis shows that while 7.3% of both white Americans and Asian Americans experience poverty according to the income threshold, as shown in 2020 census data, far fewer Asian Americans actually experience its crippling behavioral effects. You see, the income necessarily isn't the issue about poverty. The issue about poverty is the behavioral effects or the behaviors that tend to link to low incomes. But Asian Americans inconvenience that because they come here with no money, so they're going to be put under the poverty line. But because of solid cultural and educational practices, they're quickly able to advance in society. Because of cultural time-honored values that any culture, any race, it doesn't matter who you are, can experience. You see, Asian American success is the antithesis of wokeness because it shows that culture, not race, not privilege, pays the most dividends in this country that is based off of meritocracy. Because, and I ask you this question, how could a systemically racist country allow a minority, a historically discriminated minority, to get ahead of even whites on the socioeconomic ladder. Why would white supremacists let them do that? So you can see how Asian Americans inconvenience the woke narrative that America is a systemically racist country. And because of this, you need to understand that the woke are also against Asian American success because it undermines their narrative that America is a systemically racist country. So what is the move? What is the move that woke people make? The move that woke people make is they classify Asians with whites. They say that Asians benefit from white privilege, and I'll point you to this graph right here. This is the University of Maryland's admission statistics right here, based off of race. They have uh, 
over here, you can see new freshman admission and enrollment. And here's how they classify them. Students of color minus Asian. Row below white or Asian students. We get lumped in with whites. We are now the beneficiaries of white privilege. And then they just, they use this classification to discriminate against Asians as a privileged minority. Look at this chart. This is the uh, race, race, Asian ratio of uh, at all seven Ivy Leagues between 1990 and 2011. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown, Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Penn. You see, there's a little spike here in 1993, and then some admissions officers realized that there were too many Asians. So that, then they started colluding and pushing down Asians to about 15 to 18% of their student body right here. And it all congregates right here. There is no standard deviation whatsoever here, guys. Every single year, it's the exact same thing. This is a quota. All seven Ivy Leagues do it. And do you know how, I mean, as if this graphics isn't, isn't um, crazy enough, you see this is Caltech right here. Caltech is banned from discriminating against Asian Americans because of Proposition 209 in California. You're banned from using race as a category. And you can see the Asians go up to 40% in Caltech. In fact, what we know is that an Asian American has to score 440 points higher than a black American to have the same chance of admission to Harvard. It has to, they have to score 300 points higher to have the same chance of admission as a Hispanic and 150 points higher to have the same chance of admission as a white person. So these elites, these woke elites, they can't stand the thought of Asian Americans ruining their narrative, so they suppress them from the equation. But guys, that's not even the worst part. It's not even the worst part because we talked, so we talked uh, introductorily, we talked about what the woke ask from each race. We talked about what the woke ask from white people. And then we talked about what the woke ask from black people. But what the woke ask from Asian Americans is perhaps the most insulting ask out of all of the races. Their ask is to have Asian Americans renounce their success. Here's what I mean. This is a pick, this is a article in the Atlantic entitled The Whitening of Asian Americans. This is written by an Atlantic writer named Iris Quo. And articles like this, by the way, are everywhere. You see in the New York Times, the Atlantic, Time magazine. Everything I see about Asian Americans is about how proximal they are to white and how they benefit from white privilege. So this Atlantic author, Iris Quo, says that Asian Americans have become successful because they have adapted to white tastes. It is why whites let Asians in the club. That's right. We're not successful because of hard work. We're successful because we kiss up to white people. <laughs> How degrading is that? And it gets more degrading. In my book, An Inconvenient Minority, I tell the story of the Yale undergraduate Eileen Huang, who asserted that this is the Yale undergraduate Eileen Huang. She asserts in her article on ChineseAmerican.org that went viral, she asserted that Asian success has come at the expense of Black success. She goes as far to say as her entire Asian American community is racist against Blacks. She says in this interview right here, anti-Black racism is ingrained in my Chinese-American community. She says loudly, 
There's no question about where this Yale undergraduate English major got the audacity to speak for the entire Chinese American community and in degrading their success as a product of an alliance between Asian Americans and white racists. We know where she got this narrative from. She got it from Yale because she knew that she would be affirmed and celebrated within her woke university for saying such an absurd thing. Because only in an Ivy League university can you say such absurd things. But let me just debunk this for you one more time. The reality, here's the reality. Asian Americans have gained their success in the least white and most poverty stricken areas of the United States. One only need to think of the Korean shopkeepers who started their businesses in the heart of East Los Angeles in communities that were 90% black and Latino, or the Chinese restaurant owners in Queens, New York, who sweep their own floors and pinch nickels together to send their sons to extracurricular enrichment. The reason why they started their businesses there was because they could not afford the suburbs. This does not sound like an Asian white alliance against black people. This sounds like just another immigrant minority trying to use their limited resources and their opportunity to make it in America. And they have, they have made it. They are the epitome of the American dream and they should be proud of it. They should not be apologizing for it. See, my friends, we, these are the lasting consequences of wokeness. We're moving from a country that treats people on the basis of merit and rewards people on the basis of their individual and community success to a country that wields the weapon of a person's background against them. This is why you see so many young people, many of you I'm sure have sons, daughters, grandsons, grandsons. This is why you see so many young people today clutching their identities so tightly. Because to a young person today, in schools, in their trainings, in extracurriculars, they're being taught that their race, gender, and sexual orientation is a kind of currency that they can exchange for preferential treatment. The more you go down this path, the more you move away from meritocracy, the more you look at a person's background as a way to attack them, the more you will see this happening in our culture, and it's already happening. In my book, An Inconvenient Minority, I address what happens when meritocracy collapses, as it has for the top applicants at Harvard. Victimhood and race have become a currency. And let me tell you this, this affects everything in the elite stratosphere. What happens is that when Harvard sacrifices meritocracy, you have these college consultancies that spring up, and we know this. They each try to offer that edge to wealthy and privileged students who can pay for the connections to get into Harvard. And what happens is that these admissions officers become more and more corrupt and continue to reward the children of donors and legacies to the schools, the ones that can pay for it, the ones who know how to play the game over the people who just want to get into their dream school and study their butts off to get there. So you can see now, and I hope you see now, that these Asian Americans suing Harvard University in the new landmark case, Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard, a suit that was filed in 2014 that is now at the foot of the Supreme Court, where Asian Americans are finally challenging Harvard on its discriminatory admissions process. These Asian Americans, these woke disruptors, are the only ones who are standing in the way of Harvard and Harvard's vision being implemented into society. These students are heroes. 
These students are heroes because they proudly assert who they are and what they deserve. They are successful because they studied their butts off for it. They didn't cower in the face of the woke. They know their value to this country and they assert it. Guys, there's a, there's this temp, there's a temptation for me at this point in the speech, if I wanted to, to join into this woke narrative and reapply it to Asian Americans. I could make arguments, for example, about why Asian Americans are currently even more oppressed than people of other minority races. I could point out the anti-Asian crimes, the uptick in violence. I could share the obvious advantages that Blacks and white legacies get in admissions and hiring compared to Asians. I could join in. I could join in and I could say wokeness plus Asians, but I don't want to because I know that no American benefits from accusing each other of racism. Nobody, it benefits nobody. It doesn't benefit blacks, it doesn't benefit whites, it doesn't benefit Asians, it doesn't benefit anyone of any race. Rather, I believe that America benefits when we come together and protect our highest ideals. I think about my friend, Bin Vo. He's a Vietnamese immigrant. He came to this country at the age of 18. He spoke no English. The first day that Bin comes into this country from LAX, he's walking home. He doesn't know where to go. He's lost. And a police officer comes behind him. Boop, boop. And he stops, he freezes, and the police officer comes out. And the police officer says, son, you look lost. Can I take you home? The police in Vietnam would have tried to extort him, he says. See, every Sunday, Ben goes to the shooting range with his redneck white friends in Oregon. There's not even a pulse of racism in these white people, he tells me. And he's right. America is an astoundingly colorblind country. In fact, 94% of all Americans would be totally okay with living next to a neighbor of a different race, according to the newest 2015 Washington Post poll. This is higher than China, Japan, India, and most of Europe, including Germany, France, Spain, Italy, and Russia. Americans are extraordinarily tolerant and generous. We're extraordinarily colorblind. And wokeness does not help this colorblind mission of America. It's making our country weaker. Last, this year, I became president of a new group called Color Us United. And we are fighting for an America where race is no longer part of the equation, where we can fully transition to becoming a race-blind country for all. This is what I stand for. This is what I care about. There are forces at work, wokeness, corporations, people, Harvard's elite culture, trying to damage this, trying to make race, put race back into the equation. We have to fight back. This is our website, colorusunited.org. For example, the Salvation Army. Members are now, in the Salvation Army right now, members are now being asked to repent for racism in these new diversity and inclusion trainings. These Salvation Army members are the least racist people in America. They just care about helping the poor and giving them a home and giving them food to eat. And you're now accusing them of racism and not even the culture, it's their own leaders who are now accusing them of racism. So we have to disrupt them. We are organizing the employees and donors of the Salvation Army together to fight back. And our message is very simple. The Salvation Army is the epitome of race blindness in this country. It is evidence of America's goodness and we have collected over 10,000 signatures. 
So many, in fact, that the commander of the Salvation Army, Kenneth Hodder, invited us to speak with him. And over a $100 lunch, we broke the ask. Commander Hodder, we want you to write a statement on behalf of the Salvation Army to denounce critical race theory. And Commander Hodder said to me, Kenny, I will pray about it. And he said, after prayer, Kenny, I regret to say I will not write a statement denouncing critical race theory. And I said, well then, Commander Hodder, I'm sorry that we haven't worked hard enough to convince you. And we are restarting this campaign and we will continue campaign after campaign to restore what America truly is, a race blind meritocracy. To win in a culture dominated by elite wokeness, a culture that is found upon all of us here, you cannot play the left at its own game. You must be a nuisance. You must be a pirate. You must learn the art of the bad joke because when someone laughs, the left loses a little. That is what Color Us United will do. Through persuasion, exposure, and a little humor, we will beat back wokeness by making examples of organizations that oppress people based on their race. And I ask for your support in this fight. We're a young organization set up to do institutional guerrilla warfare specifically for this moment. And we are gaining steam quickly. So you can go to colorusunited.org or talk to me and we can work things out. My friends, I go back to the story of Phil Lubin. Whether you're an inconvenient minority or a non-complier in the race narrative, one act of civil disobedience, one act of humorous subversion can set off a fire in those who seek to control and police narratives. We need more non-compliers. We need more race changers. We need more inconvenient minorities. We need more disruptors to the field than ever. Our culture, our meritocracy, the strength of America and the next generation is at stake. And until then, the next time someone at your company's diversity training brings up the subject of how white people need to do this and that, you can raise your hand and you can say, excuse me, but I'm not white. Well then, what are you, she might ask, to which you will reply, none of your business. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny, that was wonderful. Uh, we have a question from the chair of the Union League Legacy Foundation, Joan Carter. Joan. Kenny, thanks for your comments. Uh, I wonder why the Asian community has historically and continually voted on the left-hand side of the aisle, which has done everything possible to oppress them. I identity politics is very powerful in this country right now. It's still, it's, it, is, it has always been powerful. It was powerful with the Irish. Um, it was powerful with the Italians. It's powerful, of course, with the black community. Um, but with Asian Americans, it's also powerful. Um, Again, there is that appeal to the sense of marginalization that you get because of your race. Um, that was exploited this year with um, Black Lives Matter and the anti-Asian attacks that have been going on. Um, let, me give you a, let me just give you an example of that. So in a Pew Research report a couple years ago, they asked minorities how much they value their race or they, how much they, they feel their race is important to them. And white people, only 15% of white people viewed their race as somewhat or very important. 30% of Hispanics viewed their race as somewhat or very important. 50% of Asians viewed their race as somewhat or very important. And 75% of Black Americans viewed their race as somewhat or very important. So when you view your race as someone are very important, you are inclined to see things through that light. That means people making racial appeals, such as what the left does, they make racial appeals, appeals all the time. It makes it attractive to you. And that is something we're still getting over the hump right now. But I think the winds are changing. The election in Virginia is changing that. 
You can see, and I'm convinced the exit polls will show this, that Asian Americans probably flipped to Youngkin in a way that, um, that has never been done before because they're seeing what's happening to their kids in these schools. They're seeing what's happening because of the woke ideology. They're seeing what's happening in Thomas Jefferson High School, the nation's leading science and technology high school there. Um, they just recently created a plan to have, um, instead of admitting people based on merit, they're gonna admit people based on the lottery because 71% of the people admitted based on merit were Asians. So I think that people will become more attracted to this side, um, and, uh, but they have to get over the hump of racial identity politics first. Kira? Um, I guess my question is, where, where, where is all this going? I mean, what is the promise of woke? If everybody adopted it, where would it be? And one theory I play around with, and I'd be interested in your view on this, is that the promise of America, what America is uniquely positioned among all the nations that ever existed on the planet Earth, is to create the American race, which would be a unique race of all peoples, all cultures, every walk of life. And I see wokeness as something that's deterring us from the promise of America, which is the American race. I'd be interested in your views on that. Sure, absolutely. So um, as I said in, in the first slide, wokeness is the assertion that America is, is that America is a racist country above other views. So you cannot believe in, say, the American dream, which says that, um, that if you work hard and come to this country, doesn't matter what your background's from, you can succeed in this country. That is a, that is a, a mutually exclusive view to wokeness, which says that you're gonna be treated based on your background no matter what, no matter what you try to do in this country. Ultimately, the vision of wokeness is to have a country where people who, where, where people who are in certain backgrounds and who say and who position themselves at the top of the moral virtue hierarchy, as I, as I explained in this speech before, the woke are trying to create a separate virtue hierarchy and based on your indulgence in this narrative. And they want to position the woke at the top. Um, in, in a sense, wokeness is a very cynical ideology because the people who are preaching it are the ones who benefit the most from it. Um, uh, the head of diversity and inclusion at your company, um, the, uh, the Google's uh, chief diversity officer, UC Berkeley's officer of diversity and inclusion. In a sense, they want racial division so that they can justify the discrimination narrative that keeps them in their salary and, and um, in power. Okay, I thank you for the presentation of facts and figures. It's very enlightening. My question is, mm -hmm. uh, in our highly divided country right now, perhaps the only consensus and agreements among people on the left and the right is, okay, uh, first I, I thank him for presenting facts and figures. It's highly enlightening. And uh, thank you. My question is, in our highly divided country right now, perhaps the only national issue that the people on the left and the right agree to is the upcoming uh, Cold War with China, especially in, in the technology area where comp uh, technological competitiveness is really the center of our national well-being. So in that regard, has the people that you, you've been interacting with, whether they are on the left or the right, whether they are woke or conservative, been talking about or start to be aware of, of uh, this uh, dumb down of the American educational system for the sake of a, a, a quota, how that's going to impact our national uh, technological competitiveness. For example, China is known to be a purely meritocracy for 2000 years. And now their annual college entrance exam, every student gets a randomly assigned uh, number only at the end, when all the grades have been uh, published, 
their identity is tied back to that not number and the schools are assigned based on where they rank. So it's a purely a meritocracy. So if our society is structured down the road that small firm will be penalized because they cannot hire enough black and Latino engineers and ended up yeah. in the in the innovation field has much higher fa failing rate. And maybe 20, 30 years down the road or not even that long, we probably will fall behind a much more meritocracy based uh, system it not, let alone that China has four or five times our population size and a lot more uh, engineering science graduates. Uh -huh. So ha has people uh, in... Kenny, Kenny, what are your, yeah, what are your so thoughts? I, what I want to say, I want to say two things about what you said. So first is I want to revise what I said before um, about somebody asked what the, uh, what the woke want. So in the end, what the woke want, and I want to add on to that, is a social credit system. They want a social credit system in which being a part of a certain class or a certain background grants you certain privileges and being part of another class, another background grants you certain disadvantages. Um, sort of like what China is like developing right now with their surveillance state and their social credit system, whereby, you know, allegiance to the party will get you certain favors um, over non-allegiance to the party and, you know, being a rebel or everything like that you know, fighting for independence is going to get you docked in the social credit system. So ultimately what the woke want is a social credit system. Um, with regards to what you said about American competitiveness. So we have two goals in America, right? America's always had two really important goals. One is we want to create opportunities for those who can't afford it. And two is we want our excellent to be the most excellent. Okay. Those are, I think, two really good goals. They're two separate goals. You can't have one interfere with the other. So on one sense, we have a lot to work on with regards of our public education system. I'll tell you one issue that's going on right now. The average SAT score for Black Americans has not increased over the last 30 years. That's a travesty, a complete failure um, in the public education system. By the way, we spent three times as many more dollars on the average student as we have in 1980. So adjusted for inflation. So it's not a money problem. It's a failure of teaching problem. It's an indulgence teaching and parenting problem. Um, and uh, it's a critical race theory problem because of course critical race theory has been in our schools for the past 30 years um, through critical pedagogy exercise. That's a separate speech. Uh, um, the, um, the, so we can do it, the point is we can do a lot to improve the educational system for the least advantaged, uh, for low income kids of all nationalities. But we can't, what we shouldn't do is we shouldn't use those same, that same framework of logic and try to apply it in our domain of excellence. Because you start trying to apply equity principles into a domain of excellence, that's when you really start to ruin the excellence part of the excellence. Uh, so, for example, Princeton's math department, Princeton University's math department is the number one math department in the entire world. Um, there's a story that I tell in my book, An Inconvenient Minority, where they're trying to bring in a Black woman into this Princeton math department. She was, these, these, this math department is like, you're attracting like math Olympiad winners, people who have developed, you know, new math theories in middle school. And this woman was merely great at math. <laughs> and she got into math late. She was a brilliant, brilliant person. Could have used the training at another university and maybe eventually could have transferred over to Princeton University. But as it mattered, she was not qualified for the spot. And they admitted her anyways because they were really impressed with her story. And they felt like she was a really... Um, and of course she fits certain racial categories that they wanted to agree with. Now, the end result of this story is not pretty. This student gets put in a class with like the top math people in the entire world, like maybe the top 25 math people in the entire world. And she's flailing like instantly. She's unable to compete. Less than a year happens, she drops out and she gets very bitter. And it's so sad because she didn't have to be bitter 
if she was admitted into the place in which she could have accurately competed and then with the training came in and transferred. This kind of system helps nobody. It's not gonna help the most excellent and it's gonna teach the people, discourage the people who are getting there but are not there yet. It's gonna discourage them from actually pursuing excellence. We have time for one more question. Yes, you mentioned the uh, Supreme Court a Harvard case, and could be wrong, but I don't think the court has agreed to hear that yet. And I'm curious uh, mm -hmm. if the court refuses to hear it, uh, how big a setback would you would you view that, and what would be the next steps? So, the uh, the Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard lawsuit, which pits it's it's a group of Asian American applicants to Harvard who were obviously rejected by their race, who are suing Harvard University. Um, is now at the foot of the Supreme Court. And the, the, what's happening right now is that the, uh, the judges, had, the justices actually asked the Biden administration for his thoughts on the case. The Biden administration is probably going to support Harvard. Um, and, uh, um, and so they're going to come in with the amicus brief. We're still waiting on the amicus brief, but it's likely to be taken up um, by the beginning of next term, which is in January. Um, if it's rejected, um, if, or if the case falls through, yeah, it'll be a setback. There's no doubt. People have spent a lot of time on this lawsuit. We've been really trying to, to move this forward. And I do think it will be taken up. But if it, you know, it isn't taken up, um, we're just gonna have to pursue other, other ways to be able to sort of inconvenience and shake up this woke narrative a little bit. Um, so there are multiple avenues, I think, to disrupting wokeness in our culture today. I think the Asian American lawsuit is going to be a milestone because what happens is when you um, take out the racial preferences and admissions, you're basically taking out the incentive structure that gets people to sort of pander on behalf of their race or to assert victimhood on behalf of their race. A lot of the times why people assert victimhood on behalf of the race is because they can get unmerited privileges assigned to them on behalf of their racial victimhood. So when you take that out, when you ban it, um, you are, I think, doing a favor to this country. And I think that will do a lot to help turn, their, turn our country back. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenny Shu. Thank you, Kenny. Kenny, thank you for a fascinating uh, presentation. Um, if you want to hear more about the Supreme Court and that specific case, we will, I'm sure, make sure they cover this on Monday, Supreme Court preview with Jeff Rosen and Robbie George. Until then, have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much.